This is episode 391 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point, New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Well, as we sit here, Wally, the New Mexico legislature is back at it. Uh, they are looking at ways to hand average New Mexicans up to, I understand, $1,000 for joint filers, $500 payments to single filers. That is at the top of the agenda. So is the $50 million uh, the junior bill, the pork bill, as they call it. Uh, and uh, another priority that crept its way onto the agenda, at least according to the governor's press release, uh, I'll just read this uh, briefly from the governor's release. The legislature will also consider a measure to cut rail runner ticket prices for the next several months to provide an affordable options to commuters as ga gas prices remain high. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, we've talked about the special session and, and its merits at this point. Uh you know, overall, we're always happy to see money rebated out of the state. Obviously, New Mexico is in a very, very strong budget position thanks to the oil and gas prices. Uh, the the junior bill, okay, that's fine. Uh, Rail runner, uh, that just gets an eye roll from us. Uh, collapsing ridership over many, many years. High gas prices, low gas prices, uh, COVID, no COVID, etc. cetera. Uh, so... If that's all that happens, though, in the legislature, uh, I'll be a happy guy. Yeah, no question, Paul. I think that, uh, boy, that rail runner, boy, that's going to make a big difference for a lot of people. But um, it is interesting that, you know, uh, this, uh, this money they're talking about giving, if you're doing 500 for a single filer or $1,000 for a joint filer, doesn't take into account the number of kids or anything. So this is not necessarily a family oriented, uh, uh, give back. Uh, the other thing is, is that, um, here in New Mexico, we finally made it to the point where we, uh, are giving back some tax money that's collected, but, uh, we'll see if some point, if we can, uh, adjust to maybe not take so much to begin with. I think that's a way bigger step, particularly here. And I know a little later in the, a little later in the podcast, we'll discuss uh, in the city of Albuquerque how a, 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 something about a give back did not go very well. That's that's correct. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's pluses and minuses to giving more back for each kid. There's more uh, potential to give more back if you make less or as a, as a percentage or cut it off, give some income limits. And that could happen. Remember, the governor. Right. The, this is the governor's press release. That's what they're meeting today to discuss. I assume that, especially in the House, they want to get out of there as quickly as possible. I'm assuming that the governor has vetted everything with leaders in her party uh, in both houses. But you're right. They could absolutely change things. And uh, we didn't really talk about it as specifically uh, in the last conversation about income taxes and reducing taxes, but we uh, we looked at U.S. government spending. We put a new chart together showing uh, state and local spending as a percent of GDP, so the overall economy by, by state, FY22. Uh, we're at 26.79%. The next leading state is Oklahoma at 19.73. So you're right. There is a lot of opportunity out there for tax reductions, and we're going to see government barely explode here in New Mexico in terms of the spending because the mo amount of money flowing in due to the oil and gas is uh, at such a high level right now. And uh, again, prices are at over $100 a barrel. Uh, production is at record levels. We are flush with cash in New Mexico. And yeah, it's time to make some systemic changes to our state. But uh, no signs of the voting bill uh, coming up in this session. We've been very worried. A lot of people have been worried about that. If this is where they go, uh, we know that it's political. We know that it's an election year. We know that the governor and uh, her Democratic allies want to 
you know, be seen in a very positive light. Uh, and they're even timing these potential rebate checks to coincide with <laughs> election dates. So the beginning of early voting and your second yeah. check, right? Yeah. So there, there's a, a clear political effort underway. Uh, and that's frustrating. And hopefully uh, the voters will see through that and uh, and vote as they actually want to see New Mexico moving forward for the next four years, not just, uh, oh, I got some money in my pocket, I'm feeling good. But, uh, you know, it's not the first rodeo for New Mexico voters, and uh, and they'll have to make those decisions in the voting booth. So uh, when it comes to COVID-19, we haven't had as many conversations about that recently. Uh, and other states are ending their COVID emergencies, including uh, neighboring Arizona, even Oregon, ended theirs last week. Uh, now, being in an emergency doesn't necessarily mean you've enacted as strict policies as New Mexico has, but uh, I looked. Uh, the last date of the current or current-ish health order was April 1st, so last Friday, uh, and no fooling, uh, Wally. <laughs> there was no announcements that I could see. In fact, if you go on the Department of Health website, Right now, as we speak, you will find the expired health order from April 1st still listed. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, I'm assuming that the governor extended it, but I have seen zero reports in the media, and the old order remains in place. So uh, is this kind of like the tree in the forest uh, falling, and whether it makes a sound, I don't know. But uh, before I hand it over to you, it, it is clear that in real terms, the emergency is over because the state apparatus, the Department of Health and the other bodies dealing with this, uh, including the governor, have kind of moved on in terms of their time and energy. They're no longer doing the big, big press conferences and big confabs where they try to scare everybody and tell them all to do X, Y, and Z. I, I think the lingering, the most lingering effect right now of COVID is you still – uh, on the ads, uh, on the radio, uh, especially, you're still hearing a, a lot of get vaccinated, do this, do that. You know, it's not so much a day-to-day -day presence as it was before. And, and the emergency order is only, is one part of that. Yes. And, you know, right now, COVID uh, in New Mexico is uh, barely on the radar from a, a daily life point of view. It seems like... Uh, We've made it through, uh, as with COVID many times, I will say things are looking mighty good right now. Uh, the, uh, the case counts are down, uh, the death counts, uh, continue to go down. Uh, what will the fall bring? We don't know, but yes, is there an emergency now? Uh, far from it. And things have largely returned to normal, albeit with a lot of uh, hangover in terms of uh, unemployment in New Mexico, educational attainment, a lot of other things that uh, we talk about from time to time. But uh, COVID is uh, not a very big thing. And uh, also, Paul, I see a few masks out there. I think some businesses are still requiring it. Uh, it the ultimate irony is to require masks and then have people wear their mask uh, with, under their nose uh, so it's not even effective. But, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, this is the summer of normalcy if uh, things continue. Uh, whether we'll let go of this emergency status, I don't know. But it's not like they couldn't reinstitute it if necessary. So. Yeah, and that's the thing, and that's part of the reason that we want to so badly see the legislature address the emergency uh, powers of the governor is that it's not as if getting an emergency order done, put into place, is so complicated and so difficult. If you were to have the legislature at the table, so to speak, on these emergency orders, if they passed a law, uh, you know, if they did it the way we wanted to do it, there would be specific parameters as to what an emergency means. The bills introduced, though, in each of the last several sessions didn't have that in place. They just said that the legislature needs to act to uh, ratify, if you will, the emergency order after, I believe, 90 days. So the governor could 
if, if say we had a spike this fall and winter, uh, the governor could easily uh, reinstate, reinstate an order uh, and deal with it that way, even if that law was passed. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm looking at the, the COVID numbers uh, right now, the seven-day average. It's ticked up a tiny amount. Uh, we were about at 100 uh, the seven-day rolling average on April 1st, we're now at 135. Uh, that's a very small uptick uh, by the standards of where we've been. Uh, you know, we, we slipped under the 200 uh, daily case level back in mid-March. I mean, for, for perspective, at the very peak in January, uh, this is the peak of all the pandemic in terms of cases. We were at 5,500 per day uh, back in mid to late January. So uh, we're way, 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 way down in terms of the daily cases. This is, of course, according to world O-meters. And, uh, uh, you know, I, by all accounts, we're not in an emergency. Whether we officially are or not, that is, I think, the the question. Uh, uh, quoting Shakespeare almost, uh, <laughs> To be in an emergency or not to be in an emergency? That is the question. Uh, speaking of COVID-19, uh, a report was put in the, it was published in the Guardian, uh, UK Guardian. Uh, the pandemic has delayed social skills of young children and uh, goes on in the headline to say, rising numbers unable to understand facial expressions and have communication and self-care delays. Now, uh, we, this is something that you and I and numerous other people discussed. It's just one of the many, many other important impacts related to COVID that were more or less directly caused by the COVID mitigation efforts. And, you know, we've said that the traditional masks that people wore for most of the pandemic were wholly ineffective, but they were effective at covering your face and your facial expressions, thereby limiting the learning of these children. And hopefully the children catch up. Hopefully they're not permanently scarred and uh, set, on, set on a path of inferior socialization and self-esteem and learning and all these kinds of things. We don't really know. Nobody has ever in, uh, had a longitudinal experiment where uh, a certain group of kids was... Uh, facing only adults with masks on. It's never been done. And I think if you did, did that, if you tried to get that kind of experiment done in a uh, academic setting, they would say that it was cruel and unnecessary. But uh, it was a real world experiment and uh, and the impacts are going to last for decades. Yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I read that once I saw the, the, the show plan from you, Paul. And uh, just anecdotally, uh, I have a family member who is a uh, public school teacher, and uh, they tell me that social, general socialization skills, just behavior in the classroom is uh, good or bad as it was prior to uh, COVID-19 is far, far worse. And uh, this particular teacher, very conscientious, uh, had to... Uh, make a quick trip uh, to New Mexico, but wanted to get out of here because they did not want to have even one day away from the classroom because of the challenges that the kids were facing from a discipline and a social point of view. Didn't want, not want to turn the, that over to a substitute teacher. But yes, so we have that. Uh, we have uh, discipline in the classroom, and then we have educational attainment to throw that all on top of that. And then the other place that uh, I've seen personally, the really fallout from masks is in the, is in the senior community. Uh, have an elderly re uh, relative uh, that that lives with us, and just how hard during all of this communication is with a masked uh, care provider in terms of how difficult that is. So there's no question that there has been a lot of impacts, and uh, you know. Children, uh, children are very uh, flexible, and they have a lot of ability to change. And hopefully, as you say, this is not going to be this sort of permanent thing. It's something that can be rectified, that they can come back from a, a, as a group. And uh, but is that is, uh, and we've talked uh, 
from the very beginning, uh, the educational aspects, and this is a, a sub, you know, even more fundamental than that, just uh, basic capability. One of the things that we were most concerned about is we've talked about COVID uh, week in and week out over the last uh, year and a half, two years. Yeah. And of course, we talked about the academic aspect and how uh, New Mexico students lost significant ground during the pandemic uh, in, in math and reading scores. So uh, those are other permanent uh, aspects of the, the pandemic that really uh, we don't know exactly how it's all going to pan out in the future. And of course, the financial and budgetary aspects uh, as well had a conversation with Evan Jones. He's a real estate agent locally on the board of the Rio Grande Foundation, but uh, just talking about the challenges in that particular sector right now, uh, one of the main influencing uh, factors there is just the, the flood of money that's been printed out of Washington causing rampant inflation. Obviously, housing is a very big part of that story across the country, but Every single sector of the economy is facing tremendous inflation uh, these days. And what, when will those fiscal chickens, the debt chickens, come home to roost is anybody's yeah. guess. But uh, that process, that uh, level of indebtedness has only been increased and the inflation been increased by policies directly related to the pandemic. So... Uh, yeah, oh, yeah well. and, and particularly on the inflation, you know, we uh, we were told uh, kind of in succession, one, that inflation was transitory, uh, proved to not be true. Uh, inflation really wasn't causing that much impact, uh, definitely not true. And then now what are we told now is that, you know, we're going to get this under control or not. You know, some people talk about, some don't, but yes, inflation... Uh, you know, moderate inflation is, uh, it's uh, like many things in our economy. It's, uh, you can definitely uh, manage it. But boy, if we get, continue to have these huge inflationary forces, uh, a lot of, a lot of bad things happen to the country and definitely to, uh, to people living in it. Yeah. Um, now we've talked about this subject before, but I wanted to alert folks that I revised and extended my re remarks, so to speak. Uh, relating to Deb Holland and her lack of presence in the news cycles these days uh, because of her potentially prominent role in addressing American uh, gas prices. Of course, recently the Biden administration decided to further uh, open the taps of the National Petroleum Reserve uh, a million barrels a day for the time being, and we'll, we'll see how that process goes, but that is not to be confused with new supply, nor is there a concerted effort on the Biden administration's part to actually unleash American producers to fill in the, the supply. And if, if we were going to do that, one of the primary points of contact would be Deb Holland, former New Mexico uh, U.S. representative, uh, political activist, anti-energy activist, and uh, now the head of the Interior Department, which is uh, in control of a major part of the U.S. Uh, energy production there on federal lands, specifically BLM lands. And uh, we just kind of asking the question, where, where's Deb? And now we're in National Review, Capital Matters. Hopefully we can get some attention for this issue because... Uh, we all know Pete Buttigieg uh, on his paternity leave back when uh, November and October when the, uh, uh, the, the logistics crisis, the supply chain issues were happening. He at the Department of Transportation uh, caught a lot of flack for that. Uh, Deb Holland has managed to stay very much under the radar screen, uh, not really doing anything, not really solving any of the problems with our energy crisis right now. And uh, just out talking about other issues uh, that aren't really uh, a big part of that job. And I think it's uh, unfortunate. So at least maybe the conservative media outlets, I don't expect much from the mainstream national media in terms of questioning Deb Holland, but maybe National Review, uh, we can help set the tone and start 
answering some questions or getting Deb Holland to answer some questions about her work. Yeah, and as uh, I've said before, you know, the energy secretary is out there in the news quite a bit. But interestingly, the energy secretary does not have a whole heck of a lot to do with energy, particularly uh, of the uh, kind that's oil and gas related. It's much more uh, the energy department handles the you know, the nuclear stockpile and they threw all that in there. The National Lab's very active with that. But it's really interior that has an impact as to whether you are able to produce oil and gas and if so, how much and how much it's going to uh, cost from a regulatory point of view. And then, the, you know, the things we've talked about quite a bit over uh, since the Biden administration is the uh, permitting slowdown that is active on federal land and what impact that has. And, you know, in the short term, uh, production certainly isn't suffering from the sense that it's going down in New Mexico, it's going up, the number of rigs is operating. But it's like a lot of things, Paul, you know, uh, when the pandemic first started, that first year, I was just really anticipating huge supply chain issues. And they just didn't happen that first year. Well, now they've come home to roost. Well, the same thing uh, could happen with regard to uh, oil and gas production in the U.S. is that it takes a while. And then the existing permits and the existing projects that are uh, in progress uh, start to uh, fade away and production could go down. And in today's energy environment, boy, that if the U.S. is production doesn't stay strong, uh, it's almost frightening to think of what uh, oil prices could do in the future. Yeah, and uh, it is it is funny. It's a quirk of the American system that uh, the Department of Energy, which was created during the last energy crisis, right. uh, even then, uh, it. The, the, the situation was different in the sense that there were economic decisions being made in the form of price controls and whatnot that thankfully haven't quite reared their ugly head in the current situation. Yeah, windfall but, profits tax to yeah. be one that uh, that we could talk about later, but it's like the uh, most ineffective, crazy, stupid tax that you could probably put on. Yeah, and back in the 60s and 70s, the fracking process hadn't been uh, made available yet. We really were reliant on foreign production. And, and the tragedy here is that uh, the domestic production uh, is so uh, plentiful and available that if we just got serious about uh, deploying it and getting it, uh, making it accessible, uh, Deb Holland, to name one prominent person in that whole discussion, uh, we could really solve this problem very quickly and uh, also solve Western Europe's energy dependency on Russia. But uh, we've talked about that. It's just uh, unfortunate. And I guess maybe that is the uh, that is at the nub of the issue, that understanding this situation requires more than just reading the the title, right? Like how many people in the media know? <laughs> gee, Interior Department—they actually have most, you know, most of their impact in the economy on energy. Yes, the national parks, lovely things, great uh, institutions. Glad we have them. I visited Yellowstone a few years ago. Uh, there are issues with maintaining and owning those parks, and you know how they're managed. Whether wolves get introduced and those kinds of things. But when you actually have controversy and difficult decisions being made, the rubber hits the road on the energy side of things and the yep. media, it's probably, it's probably just lost on most of them. So, well, you know, and Paul, if you, you know, <laughs> look back to, uh, the, the Carter administration and what, uh, energy policy was gas lines largely created by government policy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you, if I were to, uh, encapsulate the, uh, policy decisions, uh, that came out of that was the, uh, the really politically disastrous comment by Jimmy Carter is w wear a sweater, you know, so you can turn your thermostat down in the, in the winter to use less energy and the 55 mile per hour speed limit were a couple of things that came out of that. Uh, from a political point of view, uh, maybe Deb Holland's better off if she doesn't have anything uh, better that, to talk about than the, the weak sauce that maybe came out of the last energy crisis from the federal government. But yeah, it is interesting that 
nowhere to be found, uh, but Granholm is out there. And like I say, they'll ask her all those questions because she's got the title by her name. So, Yeah, funny stuff. Uh, uh, now, there's a report from Searchlight New Mexico that came out. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about energy on this uh, show. Uh, Searchlight is, you know, kind of a, a liberal public journalism outfit. They've done some good work. They really blew the whistle on what was going on at CYFD. They are New Mexico specific. They describe themselves as independent investigative journalism. Uh, they did a report that kind of looks at the utility situation and energy prices from the bottom up. They're, they're much more inclined to go out and talk to people out in the community who are, are struggling to pay uh, their bills for electricity and, and you know, propane and other sources. Uh, it's something that I think is worthwhile thing. And that's why I wanted to highlight it on this show, uh, showing the real struggles of average New Mexicans or uh, poorer than average New Mexicans, you know, sometimes undocumented immigrants, sometimes people living in very uh, challenging environments. But uh, the searchlight, not surprisingly, doesn't focus on the policies that make energy more expensive, but they, they talk about people accruing debt during the pandemic uh, for electricity to pay their bills, having electricity cut off. Of course, as we've said numerous times, who are the people that take it uh, the hardest, get it in the shorts when it comes to uh, utility price increases? It's the elderly, it's people with children, those on fixed incomes, and those at the bottom of the income scale. Uh, and, and finally, this report has a interesting little map. You can go down to the very bottom. Uh, again, this is searchlightnm.org. You can find out which counties around New Mexico have the uh, highest average utility prices and highest as a percentage of the income uh, that people pay towards their uh, utilities. This is an issue that is, along with the reliability aspect, only going to get worse as policymakers in the name of you know green energy, so to speak, are uh, pushing these very uh, expensive very problematic policies on New Mexicans. And uh, it, it is good, uh, if for nothing else, that these people uh, at Searchlight have done something to highlight the issue, highlight real-world pr- challenges and problems for people in New Mexico, and, uh, and kind of making that connection from the high prices and the policies. They're not making that connection, but they're it's there if you know what you're looking for. Yeah, it is there if you know what you're looking for. But, you know, one thing that that has gone on for decades now and shows no sign of abating is they they just don't ever compare apples and oranges when it comes to the prices and reliability of energy. And so they talk about the low cost of renewables and they look at a very thin slice about, you know, when, when the sun's shining in the middle of the day uh, – you can get a lot of uh, low-cost energy from a solar panel, no question about that. But you need a system to keep the lights on in the morning, the evening, at night, et cetera. And they tend to not look at those kind of systemic uh, aspects of that. And so we'll we'll see. Uh, will they ever admit? But you know, at some point, if uh, prices go up of electricity, uh, and they are going up across the country. Prices of oil, natural gas, gasoline, and our uh, to tr- uh, you know to drive our cars and trucks, as well as uh, you know either electricity, natural gas, propane to heat our homes. It's hard to hide from those price increases and say, well, no, those aren't real; those don't exist because they are real and they do exist. So, yeah, this is a good consumer-oriented story. It's one of those. It's a. It's a decent enough place to do it. But yes, that tie into how the policy going forward is going to impact. I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but you know, you never, never say never. Yeah. And it it is uh, a frustration that a lot of people on the left do have these uh, good critiques, but when it comes to solving the policy riddle, they don't necessarily uh, understand or care enough to actually uh, look at it, or they don't like where that discussion is to be uh, 
you know, found where you actually have to find the answers. And to kind of finalize on your point, Wally, uh, they talk about how cheap these renewables are, but then in the real world, when any country, Germany being a great example, or another state like California, embarks upon their recommended path, electricity prices automatically skyrocket. And it's happening in New Mexico. We're just starting to see the full financial impact, let alone the reliability impact of the Energy Transition Act, which was only passed in 2019. And really, uh, until the coal-fired power plant shuts down, we really aren't seeing the, the, the impact of that piece of legislation. Give it a little more time. And that's another thing is that these things take time. You have to actually know policies back to, ooh, 2019. That's such a long right. time. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're right. And so if you have to even look at a three, a three or five-year period, a lot of times the, uh, the cause effect is very difficult to discern. And so, uh, you know, now we're going to, we're going to see some, we are seeing supply chain issues in every uh, realm of the economy. And so will it be in green energy going forward as well? So are they going to blame that? Well, maybe they are. I mean, I think that we're seeing that it's like, oh no, the prices aren't going up because uh, we're using the wrong technology or too much of this technology, or it's not up to the challenge. It's now that we have supply chain issues. So, but uh, at some level, you know, uh, you have a scoreboard. What is the price of ele- and reliability of electricity? What is the price of gasoline? What is the price of propane? And with those as a benchmark, uh, you know, you can not always easily and quickly assign causation or blame as the case may be, but you can know that there is something in there. And we'll see a lot more of that in New Mexico in the coming years. I'm very confident. Yeah. These patterns don't happen by accidents. And, uh, Uh, Anyway, uh, speaking of energy issues, uh, our own governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, back in November, traveled uh, over to England and Scotland. And uh, at first, it was very difficult, nay, impossible for us at the Rio Grande Foundation to find out how she got there, who paid for the trip. Uh, Turns out Climate Registry, a nonprofit that grew out of the California Climate Action Registry, which is kind of corporate entities pledging to act on climate, that group, uh, and we don't know, of course, who actually, who physically wrote the check, whose money was used. That's why these things are done this way. But those are the folks that paid the bill for the governor and presumably her staff to get over to Scotland. Uh, We did find, uh, and we're finally presented with the details on her flights, uh, and she did fly over. She flew over, uh, starting from Albuquerque to Dallas, so American Airlines. Uh, They, of course, have their big hub at DFW. She flew coach there, uh, the short flight, then uh, promptly got on a uh, bigger flight, international flight in the premium economy, British Airways level. So that's more of the middle road and flew to Heathrow, Heathrow to Gatwick, also flying uh, at a higher level than coach, uh, kind of a European style, uh, different different name, but uh, basically business class. So not only does our governor get to fly uh, around the world uh, for these environmental conferences, uh, which of course those planes uh, pollute and have all those issues that she's supposedly trying to solve and could have used a Zoom meeting to get to the same uh, meeting virtually, but she uh, and her staff uh, flew presumably all together there on the uh, higher level than coach. So uh, we thought it was worthwhile information to find. And uh, by the way, those tickets cost $1,800 thereabouts for her to get across the pond. All right. So uh, you got to the got to the bottom of that, Paul. Yes, it is interesting how uh, we can uh, fly a long way to talk about how much we want to reduce energy usage. But, uh, at least in this case, uh, 
At least I will say the governor didn't fly on a private plane by one of the other uh, very noisy advocates for reducing energy that fly to places like Davos on their own private jets to uh, then make rules to tell uh, the rest of us how we need to use less energy. So uh, yeah. a mixed bag at, uh, at best, not the worst, not the best. Yeah, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of people, in fact, according to Forbes magazine, 118 private jets uh, took various people to the COP26 conference in Scotland. Uh, a thousand tons of CO2 were burnt for those people alone, let alone uh, you know, people like the governor and her staff flying over commercial. And, you know, uh, it's something that you think about. I mean, we uh, educated higher income earners, it would be interesting, and I don't know the data on this, what percentage of New Mexico's population of adults, you know, right. let's limit it to anyone 18 or above, have actually flown uh, to Europe. And right. I, I suspect that those people, uh, the vast majority of New Mexicans, I would bet it's 60 to 70 percent, have not been over to Europe. So right there, the governor is using a great deal more in, you know, CO2 and environmental impact is much higher than uh, the average person that she's going to be making decisions and hectoring them on their energy usage, taxing their usage, and making it all less reliable, uh, especially the people in that uh, that searchlight story. I, I bet that none of the folks right. in, interviewed in that story who are so energy marginalized uh, have ever flown to Europe. No, yeah, that's that's a good point, and uh, so it takes uh, it takes energy for transportation. There are more efficient and less efficient ways of doing it, and uh, the market can make some pretty good uh, decisions with regard to what the right thing to do is. You know, Paul. Do you know what probably uh, New Mexico's worst, uh, most uneconomical uh, source of transportation is? Uh, one of the uh, buses that drive around uh, Albuquerque completely empty, you know, particularly the long articulating ones. And uh, as we've talked before, they put advertisement on the windows, one, to make some money, but two, I am convinced is that uh, there'd be uh, a lot more political uprising if people saw how many of those buses are uh, and how much of the day almost nobody's on them. So, you know, it's one of those... Even trains and buses can be horribly inefficient if you don't have the uh, right density of, of customers, uh, paying customers on them uh, to be moved around. Yeah, there, there's no question about that. And the, the rail runner is the same way. Uh, with, without the bureaucrats living in Albuquerque and heading to Santa Fe to kind of uh, make that train a worthwhile project, uh, it it's not only not worthwhile, I mean, it never has been, never will be financially, but uh, the environmental impact of that, that train is certainly uh, much, leaves much to be desired. All right, uh, Wally, a lot happened at Albuquerque City Council meeting last night. Uh, some good, some bad, but uh, three major issues that the Rio Grande Foundation has worked on. Uh, and, uh, you know, last night, I will say, was the first fully open Albuquerque City Council meeting oh. since COVID. Uh, I will also say that God bless Zoom because, uh, you know, and I'm not saying I won't attend in-person city council meetings, but when you're looking at two or three different issues and testifying on them, uh, it quickly gets into a very, very late night affair. Yep. Uh, those meetings, that one started at five and they were still going as I believe until 1030 or later. And right. that's getting past my, past my <laughs> bedtime Wally. So, uh, those three issues were as follows. One was, uh, Dan Lewis, counselor Lewis has, uh, been pushing very hard to return some money to uh, taxpayers in the form of a one eighth cent GRT reduction. Uh, alas, uh, that that one got uh, beat upside the head a little bit, and uh, 
one eighth uh, wound up being the exact representation of the council that supported it. One uh, member did, eight member opposed. So uh, unfortunately, no tax reduction uh, coming anytime soon for Albuquerque uh, taxpayers and people who buy stuff in the city of Albuquerque. Yeah, and Paul, you know, when I saw that, it reminded me of the Don Adams, uh, Agent 86 from Get Smart. He used to say, missed it by that much. Well, uh, that was a huge, uh, huge miss, you know, to just get uh, one vote and only by the sponsor uh, it, it does show that it is very difficult to cut taxes. Boy, it's sure. Uh, it was uh, just think back to when they raised it. What it happened very quickly, very easily, very little analysis. Yep, we need to raise them. So yeah. it's one of those. It's certainly uh, not symmetrical in terms of the raising taxes and lowering taxes. Uh, political difficulty. Yeah, and and look. Um... I understand that the city of Albuquerque has a lot of challenges that they are facing, that the city itself is facing with homelessness and crime, uh, and those should be the top priorities. And, uh, you know, if we were getting rid of a, a lot of the most wasteful government programs offered by the city of Albuquerque, and, you know, again, we talked about transit, you know, it, the, the free buses are a very significant uh, expenditure of money that could be addressed. I personally, uh, you mentioned the, the empty buses. I think the whole bus system as, as an issue needs to be strongly reconsidered, not just the environmental impacts, but the crime aspects of, of those buses. And that's just one area of government. There's a lot of government that could be reformed. Uh, I hope to work with counselors uh, in the future to maybe uh, address spending at city council, focus the revenue on the main areas uh, where really it is, uh, it is needed crime and addressing the homeless problem uh, and leave some room for taxation, uh, tax relief in, in a not too distant future. Uh, and then we also have the uh, project labor agreements issue. That is the one that uh, raises the price of public works. Uh, the unions showed up in full force. And again, you know, while the one eighth cent tax reduction uh, did not go where we wanted it to go, uh, most of these issues are going to be decided on a very narrow basis. The project labor agreements, union giveaway on public works, uh, repeal of that giveaway passed five to four, which chances are very good. That sets us up for a veto by Mayor Keller that would hold. Right. Unless we got another counselor to go with uh, the reformers, but uh, I, I suspect that Keller, <laughs> very much in line with the the unions who showed up in droves last night at city council. But on a happier note, the plastic bag ban repeal did happen way way into the night. Uh, the vote was six to three. Uh, Clarissa Pena, the swing voter, did vote to uh, continue. The ban repeal and uh, and that will go into law and uh, we'll see what happens. You know Keller, I'm sure he he wants to keep this in place and is probably going to try some tactics in the not too distant future to get that re uh, you know reinserted into Albuquerque law. But at least at this time, uh, the plastic bag ban is dead and uh, we worked very hard on that one, so we're very happy. Yeah, that is, that is. Uh what was expected to have that veto overridden, but you know, it's, it does, uh, I don't know. It, it creates some confidence that votes will be sustained if they are six to three. We'll have to see if there's any more going forward and yeah, what, what will be the strategy on that one? Uh, you know, it's one of those, uh, I don't think we can use the public health emergency to reinstitute plastic, uh, bag bans because actually they were found to be uh, much more useful and much more hygienic during the, uh, during the pandemic. So we'll see what, what, what is going on. And, you know, in terms of elections having consequences, it's a, a trite saying, but it's definitely true. And at the city council level, we've seen what a, a, a different vote one way or the other could mean for a whole host of policies in Albuquerque. And 
the mayor's going to probably have to get used to uh, vetoing a lot of things, which has just not been necessary uh, to until very recently in his mayoral career. Yeah, and uh, kudos to the folks on city council who did stand firm. That was uh, Brooke Bassan, Dan Lewis, Luis Sanchez, Trudy Jones, uh, Clarissa Pena, and uh, Gra- uh, Renee Grout. Mm-hmm. So uh, a good uh, you know group there, standing firm, not falling for Keller and his games, and a lot of the uh, people who. Uh, did speak, you know, the environmental groups were definitely out in force. So uh, uh, kudos for standing firm. All right. With that, we will leave it there. A lot going on this week. Uh, Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube and Rumble channels. Subscribe to this show at Apple Stitcher. Have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.